the bride of Frankenstein. Plays the wedding bells. <laughs> Actually, Pretorius is kind of an asshole because, like, he's one of the reasons why in pop culture people think the monster is Frankenstein. Hello, we're doing a movie review in case you can't tell from the title. I'm Christian, this is my friend Jeremy, and my friend John. Hey, hi everyone. And the movie we want to review is the 1935 horror classic, The Bride of Frankenstein. Now this was directed by James Whale, and this is a sequel to Universal's 1931 adaptation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And this is one of those sequels I really think... It succeeds at, like, actually being just as much of a classic as the film that it's a sequel to. Oh, In some ways, I would say this is even better than the first one. And personally, I think this is the best of the Universal Frankenstein series. Yeah. In my personal opinion, of it, course. It, it, it is, because it's amazing. I, don't, I think for that time period, I don't think a sequel is not, like, a, a thing at that time. I don't know, like, I don't know if this is the first sequel or not, but first It's not the first sequel, okay, but sequels not. were not a common thing back right. then, which is why it should almost come as a surprise that this movie is as good as it is, because, once again, sequels were not really something that people did back then. No. Usually it was just one film and that was it. Like, So the fact that this is one of the first sequels, definitely not the first one, but one of them, it should come as a surprise that this one is genuinely a pretty good movie. It, uh, oh, yeah. J J but James so. Whale, when he, uh, after the success of the first film, that... They, they asked, Universal asked, do you want to make this? But he said, I have no interest, because what if I don't top the first film? And he was worried that what if this film doesn't turn out as great, is it? And I think maybe that's the reason why it's so good, because maybe he pushed himself to actually yeah. top the, the first film, film. The film that almost went wrong, that came out good. Yeah. Yeah. And it's definitely a horror masterpiece. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. I think, what I love about this film is there's just such a great mix between, like, Horror and drama, but also definitely a bit of black comedy yeah, as well. Yeah, or but humorous. That comes from Dr. Pretorius. Yes, yes he's and great. And I just love how, like, the tone never feels off. Like, there are points, the moments that are meant to be dramatic definitely make you cry. The stuff where it's meant to be a horror film definitely thrill you. And then, like, the humorous moments are freaking hilarious. Now, one thing I find interesting is really this film, I feel like, takes more inspiration from the book than the first movie did. Like, a lot of the themes about how man should not try to play God, I feel like, are much more prevalent here. And also, the whole concept of the monster demanding a mate was taken directly from the book. However, it was much different in the oh, book. Oh, yeah. In the book, you know... We never even see the female creature alive because Dr. Frankenstein just destroys it out of rage after he sees the monster's ugly face peering through the window at it. Yeah. Now, what the plot of The Bride of Frankenstein is it picks up where the first film left off. The villagers believed that they killed the monster by burning it alive. However, the monster has somehow lived through the fire. Frankenstein is now recovering from the injuries that he suffered from being attacked by his own creation. Now he just wants to leave this all in the past. However, an old professor of his named Dr. Pretorius comes to visit him. Now you eventually find out that like Frankenstein, Pretorius also created life, however in a much different way than Frankenstein did. Pretorius is now trying to tempt Frankenstein into helping him create a man-made race. Frankenstein of course refuses. Now, in the movie, you also follow the monster who just wants to be left alone. However, he's being hunted by the townspeople who just want him dead. Eventually, he ends up at the cabin of a blind hermit who takes him in as a friend and teaches him how to speak. Sadly, this happiness does not last for the monster. Eventually, the monster meets Dr. Pretorius, and the two of them now try to force Frankenstein into creating a mate for the monster. Now, in the film, Colin Clive reprises his role as Henry Frankenstein. Boris Karloff reprises his role as Frankenstein's monster. Valerie Hobson plays Frankenstein's newlywed wife, Elizabeth, who technically is the actual bride of Frankenstein when you stop to think about it. Now, Will originally wanted Mae Clark to, to reprise her role as Elizabeth in this movie. However, she was not in the best of health at the time this movie was made. Now, Hobson was actually only 17 
when they shot this film. Ernest Thessinger plays Dr. Pretorius, who in my opinion is the true villain of the film. Una O'Connor, who worked with Whale before in The Invisible Man, plays the character of Minnie in this film, and she she's really where a lot of the humor of the movie comes from. Dwight Fry, who played Fritz in the first movie, plays a character named Carl, really is a freaking sleazebag in this film. Elsa Lanchester plays the monster's bride. She also plays Mary Shelley in a little prologue in the beginning of the film. I also want to point out that John Carradine has a very small role in this movie as a hunter. Now, Carradine would return to this series as Dracula in House of Frankenstein and House of Dracula. So what do you guys think of, like, the acting and the characters in this movie? Oh, well, like the first one, it's top-notch. You know, you have Karloff back, you have Colin Clive back, you've got, I mean, he's in a different role, but you have Dwight Fry back, and of course the great Ernest Thesiger also deserves a lot of credit because such a joy to watch because you can see he's just relishing in how evil his character is. Yeah. And he's just, he's such, he's taking such joy out of everything he does, and he's so sinister in a very... Uh, for lack of a better term, joyous way, you know? Yeah, he's definitely, once again, I think he's the true villain of the film. Like, the monster's not the villain. The monster, I wouldn't even call a secondary antagonist. The monster and Frankenstein are both the protagonists of this film. Yeah. Even though they're both enemies, they're still dual protagonists in the film. If any, if there's any character who I, who I would call a secondary antagonist, it would probably be the character of Carl, played by yeah. Dwight Fry in this movie. I don't know if you guys got this implication. Remember the scene where the monster, after he escapes from the jail, and they find the dead body of this little girl? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I, I have a theory on that. I personally think Carl was the one who killed that little girl, but the monster was the one taking the, the blame. Because there was actually a subplot that was deleted from the film of Carl killing his uncle and then blaming it on the yeah, monster. Yeah, I've read about that. And yeah. I actually never heard about this just till now, actually. Yeah, yeah. I so mean, I don't know if you would agree with my theory yeah, that maybe that, he's the one who killed that little girl. That is a good well theory. Could be. I, because could if be. you look at the character of Carl, this is the kind of guy who would kill little girls. Yes, oh. absolutely. I mean, that, that's why when he, when the when the monster kills him, no no sympathy for him. Uno O'Connor's acting is so unbearably <laughs> over the top. And I liked her in this movie, personally. Yeah, I, thought, I can see I that. I thought her character was hilarious. Like, <laughs> She was such a bitch in the movie, but it was great. Yeah, but I mean, there's one part where the Burgomaster, after like hearing her, you know, crap for a while, he just goes, "Oh, shut up!" And I just want to be like, "Yes, yes, I can, I can, I can, shut up." I, I can see that, but for some reason, it doesn't like. I don't know why it doesn't bother me as much as it does for you because I, I don't know. I guess I just maybe I've seen the film so many times, I'm used to it. Like, I mean, it's entertaining. Yeah, but eventually it gets just too watch much. W watch your Invisible Man. She's more annoying in that than. It's been Brian. a while since I've seen that. I do want to point out the scene where. Uno O'Connor, like, tells Henry Frankenstein and Elizabeth, I certainly will when they tell him to send Petorius away. She leaves, and then Petorius comes in <laughs> through another door. <laughs> she was totally inept. And I feel like this film has a lot of commentary on the evil of society, because yeah. really the true villains of this film are human characters. Right. The monster's not a villain. Now, the movie also has a lot of themes of religion, and once again, I think the themes of how man should not try to play God are definitely more prevalent here, and my personal interpretation, I feel like Pretorius definitely represents Satan in the movie. Like, he's trying to tempt Frankenstein into helping him create life. In a lot of ways, I would say Pretorius represents Satan, the monster represents Adam, the bride represents Eve, and Frankenstein represents God. I don't know if you would have that same interpretation I, as I, mean, I actually agree with you on that one. I it's, would say to an extent, yes, yeah. with Dr. Pretorius being Satan. It's, um, like, it's, like, it's like Saints trying to tell him, like, make another monster, make, yeah, make another monster. Say, he's yeah. like the snake. Yeah, yeah basically, you know. yeah. I also uh, just want to mention how much I love the monster's look in this movie, you mm -hmm. know. It's taking place right after uh, he was burned in the windmill, and you know, I just love how he's first uh, shown, like, you see his hand slowly yeah. creeping around, and then you see his horribly burned face, and you see his hair has been singed off, his clothing's ripped, and you see him, like, in the water coming towards that guy, and the creepy music's playing, I think it's like, boom, 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 yeah. you know, it's very yeah, great, slow. And great, very great intro to the character. Tension building, you know, mm -hmm. and I just love that, it's great. Now, this movie took a lot of stuff from the book, but also does it very differently, like, you had the blind man sequence, which was in the book. 
However, it was much different in the book. I don't know if you guys remember yeah, it from the I, book. I, I don't remember. The line man was the father of this couple. Yeah, and then he had been kind of spying on. Yeah, basically the monster was literally spying on them by hiding out in this little shed right yeah. by their house in the book, and in a way that's both creepier but also makes the monster oddly more sympathetic in the book. Yeah, but also he eventually started helping them. He'd bring them food like without them knowing, and yeah. he'd try to help them out. Yeah, but in the movie they like cut a lot the couple yeah. out, which makes sense because that would have slowed the pacing of the movie yeah. down so it makes sense that they truncated it to just he meets a blind man and the two of them become friends and once again the scene is just so hard it, it, it but, is. Um, as far as cutting the couple out they probably just also wanted to focus on the relationship between the monster and the blind yeah, man yeah. And, and also would get in the way yeah. of that and the monster does speak in the book but the monster's not as intelligent in this movie as yeah. he was in the book once again in the book as i point out in our review of the first movie the monster basically becomes an intellectual in the book, yeah. whereas in the movie, the monster can speak, but he still sort of, he at least has the mind of a child. It's so. like broken English. Yeah. 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 Like, I, I love Karloff's uh, dialogue. As the it's so, yeah. it's so great. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Kar Karloff refused to have the monster speak, but then eventually he, had no, he realized, I can't want to lose with this. He's going to have to speak. Oh, yeah, they forced him. They did. Um, but I, I, I think it worked. Him. I mean, every line he says, though, is just delivered so perfectly. You know, I'm... <laughs> This one part takes me back to the first one where he gave him a condemning look and... When like he, he sees him, yeah. Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah. Just the... And you, the, you hear, you feel the hate in his yeah. voice. Do any, do any yeah, he just uh, goes, you know, Frankenstein. <laughs> I mean, I just love the hatred in the voice, you know, when he addresses Dr. Frankenstein. It's like, you know, I've got a bone to pick with you. And you understand why he wants to pick that bone with him. Because it's like, it's almost like this is... His child and the father abandoned him. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in the film, it's also kind of implied, or at least I got this later on from watching documentaries and stuff, but it's yeah. sort of supposed to be implied that Pretorius is gay. And I don't know if you got that same I actually did yeah. not. I actually would yeah. never have thought of that. Because James Whale actually yeah. was gay. Yes. And that, this was sort that of James Whale putting himself into it, which I don't know why you would make the villain gay, but whatever. Well, I, I mean, I get, at the they, time, homosexuality was not really accepted. No. Yeah, well, and I'm sure that was closeted. Like, nobody, oh, yeah. the public didn't know there, that James Whale was gay. There have been a lot of, uh, you know, people have found a lot of possible gay subtexts in the movie, um, you know, especially with the character of Pretorius. You can almost say he and Dr. Frankenstein are the same-sex, you know, parents of the bride, and, you know, also... When the monster goes oh my to the God, blind, I never would have thought of that. Anyway, go on. When the monster goes to the blind man's house and they're together, and then they're you know the people uh, come and they set fire to it. You could almost say that's like a metaphor for people rejecting you know same sex couples. Hmm. You know that's yeah. You know you're right. I never why. Wow. <laughs> I mean, obviously James Whale sadly was never alive to confirm any of no. this. But you know. now back to talking about how Pretorius almost represents Satan. There's a part of me that almost interprets it as maybe he actually is Satan, because it's sort of implied that he made those little people by black magic. Mm. So what if he actually is the devil, or maybe. at least the demon in human form? I mean, if he's Satan, then how was he able to be killed, you know, at the end of the floor? Yeah, that's true. How do you know he was actually killed? Oh. Because he didn't appear in any other movies after that. <laughs> Who gives a F? <laughs> actually, actually, he was there in spirit. If you look closer at the end, after when uh, Frankenstein pulls that thing down and destroys the, the castle, the actually the laboratory... You can actually see Colin Calvin Klein in the background very li little bit. That's like a little like, continuity error. Yeah, okay. and I also want to mention about that, you know, I love this movie and it is a masterpiece, but why, oh why, why the hell would you put a lever in your laboratory that just destroys the entire <laughs> thing? <laughs> Who gives a shit? Yeah, I, I don't know why. I never thought about all these ideas that we're talking about to this uh, review. Yeah, and this movie, like the first one, had a huge influence on pop culture. Like, you see Bride of Frankenstein costumes everywhere. Yeah, and the, the, like, the Munsters, uh, Lily Lo Lo Munsters is a parody of The Bride, but with uh, no yeah. bushy hair. This movie had a couple of remakes. Like, in the 80s, there was a film called The Bride, which was sort of a... It was a new 
take on The Bride of Frankenstein, even though it was a period drama. And I don't know if either of you have seen that movie. No, I haven't seen it. In no. the movie, Sting actually plays Dr. Frankenstein. You mean Sting the singer? Yes, he oh, plays okay. Dr. Frankenstein. And really? It's better than it sounds, so it's actually a great movie. And <laughs> Clancy Brown plays the monster in it. I, I can see that. It's a great movie, The Bride, but it's sort of a loose remake of this. And The Bride in the movie ends up being like the main character. Um, there's also a 1986 Stuart Gordon film titled From Beyond, which was based on an H.P. Lovecraft story of the same name and in that movie the villain was actually called Dr. Pretorius as sort of a tribute to this film. There's also, I used to watch when I was a little kid, I, I still have it, this animated film on VHS called Mad 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 Monsters. Which yes, was, I have that. Yeah, DVD. It was, yeah, it was basically a very loose remake of this and even Bride of Chucky to a certain extent is a loose remake, or at least like it was inspired. Well, yeah, yeah. It's, inspiration. Like, yeah, it, it was because when you look at when you look at the part when uh, uh, Tiffany becomes a doll, you can she's watching Bride of Frankenstein as a tribute and a little inspiration. Yeah, yeah. from Ronnie, from director Ronnie Yu. Now, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Gods and Monsters, but the title of that movie was taken from a line from this film, and that's actually a biopic on James Whale. If you haven't seen that movie, I cannot recommend it enough. It's a fantastic film. Isn't that with Ian McKellen? Yes. Yes. Yes, I've he heard of it. He plays James Whale and Brendan Fraser is in it, and it's actually pretty good in the I film. I actually could see Ian McKellen as that character, because in real, he actually is gay himself. That kind of like makes a connection. Yeah, yeah. I can yeah. see it. I don't know if you guys have heard, Gal Gadot, who plays Wonder Woman, is possibly rumored to play uh, one, uh, Bride of Frankenstein. What are your thoughts about that? Well, Maybe she could do a good job, but I don't like movies that Universal's making in their dark universe, yeah. which I think is the stupidest effing name for this. Well, first of all, I don't think it's going to happen at all, since right. The Mummy flopped at the box office, right. and their dark universe has pretty much gone right. you know, down under. Well, uh, I also, yeah, I don't like how they're trying to make the monsters superheroes. Right. I would love to see Universal making these kind of classic horror movies again, you know, but keeping them as horror, right. you know, but still have a continuity with the sequels, like, well, like they loosely used to. I mean, but they the continuity I would hope would be better now. Any closing thoughts on The Bride of Frankenstein? Uh, lo love it. It's a great sequel. Even though despite The Bride with only less screen time, but at the same time, it's still a great uh, dra dra drama film that just uh, amazes. It's, it's a great yeah. film. Well, you know, actually, I just wanted to add on to the whole Dr. Pretorius, you know, and the gay subtext. I just remembered... You know, that when he comes to Frankenstein's house and Millie tries to, like, tell Dr. Frankenstein about it, he says, he's a very queer-looking gentleman. Yeah, well, queer meant something completely different back then. Uh, one, one thing I've enjoyed about do doing this review with you guys, I'm like, wow, thinking, wow, I never would have thought of these themes that just never occurred to me watching this film. So, I hope you guys enjoyed our review of The Bride of Frankenstein. Our next movie review will be Son of Frankenstein.